Hi everyone, so this is Professor DiBiase and I want to use this video as an opportunity to chat a little bit about the reading that I'm going to have you do for Tuesday's class from James Paul G uh, on his theories of discourse. And the reason why I'm putting this video together is there's a lot of dense material, or I think somewhat dense material, in this article even though it's not especially long. And I think it's worth it to kind of walk through some of the main concepts and try and contextualize them in terms of what we've been talking about so far this semester. So at the center of all this discussion is the question of what is discourse, right? If James Paul G's central idea is this notion of discourse, what do we even mean by that term? Uh, so to get there, we need to sort of take a step back to some of our conversations around literacy. So when we were talking about Brandt and we were talking about literacy, we, we at the beginning talked about how uh, in an older model of thinking about literacy, we could think about literacy as being singular, mechanical, and binary. So when we say singular, we mean that there is simply one concept of what literacy is, right? Literacy is uh, the quality of being a literate person, right? Um, and so if you were literate, that meant that you had the ability to decode and produce written language, right? You were literate if you could read and write. And in a sense, in this old model of literacy, uh, literacy is treated as something which is binary. So you either are literate or you are not literate, right? You're either literate or you're illiterate. And that comes with a whole host of other kinds of value judgments that are attached to it um, that we're not going to go into right now, but, but I'm sure you can imagine. When we move into new literacy studies, we, we tweak this notion of literacy a little bit, right? So literacy becomes a practice rather than a thing, right? So it, literacy isn't something that you necessarily have. Uh, it is instead a set of practices that you engage with. And these practices can be connected, right? So literacy in a particular area might involve uh, multiple kinds of interconnected practices um, that are all working towards a particular end. And that different kinds of literacy might involve different kinds of practices. And as we already talked about, uh, in this model of literacy, we can start talking about how to be literate means to have access to certain kinds of knowledge, right? That you know certain terminology or you know certain elements of a history of a particular kind of topic. Uh, it might involve the knowledge of particular genres, right? So as facetious as this might sound, being perceived of as a literate student right in a college setting means knowing how to send a proper email to a professor right following certain kinds of genre conventions uh, similarly literacy might involve knowledge of certain kinds of rhetorics right certain kinds of rhetorical approaches tied to uh, the the types of practices that you're engaging in so certain kinds of arguments or strategies for argument that are appropriate in a particular kind of context and knowing how and when to use those to achieve particular kinds of goals. So it's not just the knowledge of a language, right? It's can you put that, law, that, that knowledge into practice in order to achieve certain ends? And Brandt offers a couple of contributions to this discussion about literacy, right? So first she talks about literacy has a commodity, right? So literacy has value. Um, different literacies have different values and that these values can change uh, due to any number of, of forces, right? Social forces, economic forces, political forces, cultural forces. Um, changes in any of these can affect a change in the value of certain kinds of literacy practices. Um, and she also introduces the concept that literacy is something which is sponsored, right? So we are brought into literacy uh, through sponsors, right? People or institutions that help support um, our acquisition of literacy in a variety of ways. And that these sponsors have various motivations, right? Um, from the propagation of certain kinds of political or religious ideologies to the advancement of certain economic interests uh, to more altruistic uh, motivations, right? So if you think about your parents as sponsors of your literacy, some of those are altruistic, right? They want to see you do well. They want to see you be successful and however we're defining what success might mean. Um, but there is also, there are possibly less altruistic motives such as um, the sense of pride that they might feel in knowing that they did a good job in supporting your literacy and seeing you perform at a high level, uh, the pride that they might feel in seeing you earn a degree from a prestigious institution such as Fairfield, uh, or simply the concern that if they do not sponsor your literacy in particular kinds of ways that you will be still living in their house when you are 35. So. There are multiple things that might motivate these kinds of institutions or, or individuals who sponsor our literacy.
And as Brent knows, notes, um, the process of sponsorship carries what she calls ideological freight, right? So that the process of sponsorship carries through um, some of the beliefs, the values, the assumptions of the sponsoring body, right? So as your parents sponsor your literacy, um, the means by which they do that is going to shape in some way um, your relationship to reading and writing uh, in a way that might be more aligned with a particular set of values than another. And we can see this again, we kind of talked about this in the context of, of public education, we've talked about it in the context of, of religious education, etc. Um, and we can see other examples of this, for example, in um, uh, her treatment of Dwayne Lowry, right? So you look at how he grows up, and it's clear that his political leanings are uh, shaped at least in part by the kinds of uh, reading materials and discussions that are going around, around in his house uh, as he develops some of his literacy skills. Now, when we turn to the Villanueva piece, right, uh, we can see some questions raised about sponsorship, right? So, so he talks about, uh, in particular, when he discusses seeing former professors at professional conferences still having this feeling of not belonging, right, this feeling of unease. And this piece sort of raises the question, if, if I have mastered the practices of a particular kind of literacy, why is it that I might still f feel as though I don't belong? At points, he makes reference to the idea of practicing what it means to be middle class, right? So what does it mean to practice in, quote unquote, being middle class? And uh, ultimately, I think his piece is raising this question of how is literacy tied to a sense of belonging? And so if we think about literacy being tied to a sense of belonging, then the central implication here is that literacy isn't just something that you have. It's something that you are recognized as having, right? Our sense of ourselves as literate individuals is contingent, at least in part, on how we are received and recognized by others. And this kind of is a throwback in some ways to what Downs talks, to, talks about when he's discussing the issue of identity, right? So we have an identity that we carry with us, but part of that sense of identity is, is projected onto us by others' assumptions about who we are. So here comes G and discourse. And so he wants to argue that literacy, if we're thinking about purely in terms of language and grammar and linguistics, is not really sufficient and that all literacy practices are social practices. And so a couple of quotes from the piece that kind of, you know, drill down this, right? So the focus of literacy studies should not be language or literacy, but social practices, right? And that it's a truism that a person can know perfectly the grammar of a language and not know how to use that language. And it comes to this idea of, right, it's not what you say, but how you say it. And I think most of us have heard that concept before, or, or at least understand it on some sort of intuitive level. And yet, G wants to take it a little bit further. It's not just about um, what you say and how you say it. He also wants to argue that it's what you are and do when you say it, right? That, that who you are in the process of saying something and how you act in the process of saying something um, also determine whether or not you are successful in communicating. And so what he was going to argue is, quote, right, what is important is not language and surely not grammar, but saying, writing, doing, being, valuing, believing combinations. And for G's purposes, these combinations taken as a whole are going to be what he refers to as discourse. And he uses the capital D, uh, in order to distinguish it from discourse in general, right? So discourse with a lowercase d really just means sort of language and communication. But with this capital D, he's sort of coining the phrase, uh, coining this idea of, of discourse being this larger set of, of items, right? What you say, how you write, what you do, who you are, what you value, what you believe. Uh, and he gives some examples of this early on in the text with respect to um, the two women he describes as taking sort of a mock interview. Uh, and in these two cases, right, the first person, you know, is deemed unsuccessful uh, by the, the researchers conducting the study because she uses language in a way that is perceived to be inappropriate for, for the, the environment of a job interview. Um, but G wants to also argue that the second instance also demonstrates someone who is unsuccessfully using language because although she is mirroring uh, language practices that are more closely aligned with what you'd expect in a, in a quote unquote formal job interview, uh, her use of those language practices are expressing values 
uh, and attitudes that are not aligned with the expectations of an interview. Uh, so he gives the example of um, what it means to be kind of taking initiative and in many cases her examples of what it means to be uh, kind of taking charge uh, it's just another kind of supervision, right? And he says, right, namely supervision by other people's knowledge and expertise. And she doesn't actually, you know, he says, she fails to characterize her own expertise in the overly optimistic form called for by such interviews, right? So this idea is that even though she's using the language uh, correctly from a grammatical standpoint, she's expressing the wrong values in the process. And so she's also unsuccessful. So again, it's not just what you say and how you say it, but it's the, the values and beliefs that are encompassed in what you're doing in the moment. And so when G is talking about discourse, he wants to talk about it in a couple of different ways. And one of the ways that he does this is by breaking it down to two different categories, right? So there's primary discourse and secondary discourse. And to put it really, really simply to start off the conversation, right? Primary discourse is the discourse of your home or your home community, right? It's your sense of identity when you are with the people uh, who are closest to your sense of self. Um, it's where you, it's the language practices where you grew up. It's the, the attitudes and beliefs that you absorbed as you were growing up at home. Um, and we all carry with us a primary discourse, right? It's impossible to not carry with you a primary discourse. We then have secondary discourses, right? Uh, everything else, all what he calls non-home-based social institutions. And, and we all carry multiple kinds of secondary discourses. Um, so he gives examples of, uh, you know, stores, churches, schools, community groups, uh, state and national businesses, agencies, and organizations and so forth, right, end quote, and that's all from 511. Uh, and he notes that, quote, each of these social institutions commands and demands one or more discourses, and we acquire these fluently to the extent that we are given access to these institutions and are allowed apprenticeships within them. And he calls these secondary discourses. So the idea here is that uh, to, to acquire uh, fluency within these discourses uh, requires a kind of apprenticeship, not unlike Brandt's notion of sponsorship. So for G, there are these two kinds of discourses, right? You've got your primary discourse and you have these secondary discourses. And it ties directly into what he thinks about when he thinks about what literacy really means. So if secondary discourses are these, you know, saying, writing, uh, being, doing, believing, valuing combinations tied to non-home social institutions, then he wants to define literacy as what he says is the mastery of or fluent control over a secondary discourse. Now, when we come into class on Tuesday, we'll talk a little bit more about what this mastery or control might mean and how one acquires it. So in preparation for Tuesday, a couple of things. One, uh, I want you be, to be prepared to discuss the following. Uh, the difference between dominant and non-dominant discourses. Uh, G's argument that he puts forward in paragraph 19 uh, regarding whether or not it is possible to, um, quote unquote, be let into the game uh, of a particular discourse if you haven't had the necessary apprenticeship. Uh, I want you to be prepared to talk about his concept of tests that appears on 511 and then uh, he comes back to towards the end of the article, particularly on 514 and 515. Uh, and again, we'll use the same practice that we did last week. I'll just sort of put together a random list of numbers to assign to students and we'll use that to determine who'll be kicking off our conversations on these various topics on Tuesday. So please be prepared uh, with your notes. In terms of weekly writing for Tuesday, I'm going to ask you to identify a secondary discourse you possess or belong to based on your reading of G and your understanding of secondary discourses. I want you to describe the saying, writing, doing, being, valuing, believing combinations that you see tied to that discourse. So for example, what kinds of speech or writing are important? What are the activities or actions that sort of mark you as belonging to that discourse? Um, what are the sort of values or beliefs that are tied to that particular discourse that signal you as being a member of that particular community? 
Um, and I also want you to spend some time discussing whether or not you see that particular secondary discourse as being dominant or non-dominant and why. Make sure that you're referring back to the G in order to justify uh, your responses. So I look forward to our conversation on Tuesday and using your writing as a jumping off point for that conversation. So again, uh, please be sure to have this piece read for Tuesday's class and the writing done in advance of our Tuesday session. And uh, we will speak then. Take care.